All right, so this is Physics 1C for um, November 24th. Tonight we're going to be talking about EM waves. EM is short for electromagnetic. Um, and amongst that topic, we have a lot of different kind of subtopics. Um, we're going to discuss first just why it is that electromagnetic waves can be produced based on Maxwell's equations. Um, we're going to talk in general about something that's called a wave equation, um, which is something that you may or may not have learned if, you, if you've already finished 1B. Uh, I know in my 1B class, we're supposed to talk about it this week. Um, and then uh, next, we'll talk about specifically a derivation of why it is that electric and magnetic fields satisfy uh, or, or create a wave equation that is uh, synonymous with the type of waves that are produced on strings and the waves that are produced in water and stuff like that, a traveling wave equation. Um, and then we'll um, go into specific examples of what electromagnetic waves can do, first by describing uh, kind of probably the simplest type, which is a sinusoidal wave. Um, and then we'll go into the energy that these waves can carry, as well as the momentum that they can carry. And then finally, um, we'll talk about radiation pressure and what's called solar sailing. I don't know if we'll have enough time to get to that last topic, because um, I think that the mathematics of this can be kind of hard to understand. But one thing I want to emphasize tonight is that our goal tonight is to really describe what electromagnetic radiation is. Uh, what you know as electromagnetic radiation, the more common language we use for it is light or radio waves or... Uh, x-rays. These are all examples of electromagnetic radiation. And um, really the goal of tonight's lecture is for you to understand a little bit more about what light is. That's kind of the goal is, is you should be able to, at the end of today's lecture to kind of walk away with a, a little bit better understanding of what light is. And I think that that's a pretty profound thing to be able to discuss uh, in a short, <laughs> short three hour lecture. Um, because light is this uh, very ephemeral thing that's very difficult to understand. Um, we can observe it, we can produce it, right? You can turn on a light, and we've discussed in this class you know, how it is that a light bulb produces light um, by, by you know, glowing red hot and stuff like that. But um, we, we don't really understand yet until tonight about like what is starlight and how can starlight travel across the vastness of the cosmos so that we can see these little twinkling, twinkling stars in the night sky. How can we see the light that's produced from planets? Planets also produce huge amounts of light when you look at them in the night sky. And that light can be sent over vast distances and it can be observed by us. And then, you know, how are those things, how is that light that's produced by a star similar to the light that's produced by a light bulb or a laser beam or something like that, right? So that's, that's what we want to do tonight. And I think this is a pretty fascinating subject because light is one of the... Um, I think it's one of the most difficult things about physics is understanding this thing called light because... Um, in physics 1a, you know, you discuss physical objects and how they how they operate and how they work. You can you can physically touch them and play with them, um, such as like how bicycle wheels rotate and how they gain, you know, energy and stuff like that. Um, and then in 1b, you talk about like fluids, which you can obviously touch, and 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 pressure, which is a phenomenon that we can feel from gases. And um, it's all it's all very physical, right? And light is very, as I said, it's ephemeral. It's it's this idea, this energy that's transported over over a vacuum or through the air and um yeah so let's uh let's get right into it now we discussed maxwell's equations in the past um and one of the things about maxwell's equations is that you can you can take maxwell's equations together specifically what are called like the third and fourth equations um and they basically describe for us um exactly how uh, electric and magnetic fields can affect each other. So in particular, there's two of them that we want to talk about. Um, we're going to be talking almost exclusively tonight about Maxwell's equations in free space. And in free space means that um, there are no charges, okay, and there are no currents, at least within the medium of free space. There's going to be charges that produce these fields, but but within the space itself, imagine light traveling from a distant star, there's gonna be no charges and no currents. And if you if you make that statement, this is what Maxwell's equations look like. Gauss's law becomes uh, the integral of e dot dA is equal to zero. Normally it would be equal to the charge enclosed, but it's equal to zero because there's no charges. Um, just like, uh, same thing for this one. And then you've got um, Faraday's law which says that the line integral, actually not like that, just this, of e dot ds is equal to the time rate of change of this quantity right here, 
the integral of b dot dA. There's a negative sign on this one. And then the fourth equation, which was known as uh, Ampere's law, is integral of b dot dS is equal to the time derivative of the integral, the magnet, the electric flux. And then in front of this one, and this part's pretty important too, there is um, a symbol, or, or two symbols, the magnetic and electric constants, mu naught times epsilon naught. So those are Maxwell's equations, right? And in principle, if we look at the last two, which are the most important to think about, what they tell us is that if you have a changing magnetic field over here on the right-hand side of the equation, it produces an electric field. And if you have a changing electric field, it's going to produce magnetic fields circulating around it, right? And the effect of that is that you can get this kind of like loop, kind of like this like feedback loop, which is that you start off with a changing magnetic field, it produces an electric field, but if that electric field is changing, then it can produce a magnetic field, and that whole process can start all over again, right? So you go from magnetic fields to electric fields, and then you go from that same electric field down here to a magnetic field, and then that magnetic field can basically repeat the process all over again, right? This is ultimately what we're going to use today to, sh to show what a, what a light wave is is that a changing magnetic field produces an electric field that might change in time to produce a magnetic field that might also change in time to repeat the whole process over and over and over again. Especially if the function that you use for your magnetic field is like a sine function, then when you take the derivative of that sine function, you'll get like a cosine function. When you take the derivative of that, you get a sine function again, and it'll just repeat itself, right? So that's at its core what we're going to describe tonight, uh, is how that's done, and we're going to do so by kind of looking at a one-dimensional wave that, that we can understand. So before we go into the actual mathematics of it, let's talk about some kind of the, the bigger picture um, uh, thing about this. So, so Maxwell uh, knew something um, going into this, uh, this work that he did. Um, and what he knew was that this, this term that shows up in this, this equation here, this mu naught epsilon naught, I don't know who figured this out, um, but I know that Maxwell knew this because because he writes it down in his own in his own writing. But he knew that this quantity happened to be exactly not even a little bit, but like a hundred percent exactly equal to um, the speed of light. And I think like being a very very good mathematician as Maxwell was, so we use the symbol C for the speed of light. And it has the quantity, it has the value of about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And I think we did this as an exercise. I asked you to, to calculate what that was equal to. And you see that it's equal to almost exactly the speed of light, approximately. I mean, this is actually something like 299, um, 2.99 times 10 to the 8 or something like that. But it's close enough. 3 times 10 to the 8 is usually what we say. Right? So Maxwell kind of knew this. This is well known in Maxwell's time that it just happened to be the case that this was true. And so Maxwell was like, well, what if we just play with the mathematics um, and, and see what happens? And what he proved was that, um, and this is why we call them Maxwell's equations, um, he showed uh, that um, an electromagnetic disturbance To produce waves that travel at the speed of light. And we're going to go through the derivations tonight. So we're not going to do exactly what Maxwell did. What he did involves a, a lot of vector calculus, and it's really quite complicated, but you can get the exact same result without relying on that. Um, so what, what is this part? This is the thing that you need. So let's talk about waves in general. So what is a wave? Um, a mechanical wave, there's a whole chapter in this textbook, uh, I think it's chapter 15 or something like that, chapter 15, where you talk about what waves are. And a mechanical wave is something where you've got some kind of a medium like water, you have a disturbance, like you throw a rock into the pond, and ripples go out. That's a wave, right? So what Maxwell was thinking was maybe you could have a similar type of disturbance, um, 
by having, for example, um, an accelerating charge. And I'm going to show you a little uh, visualization of this. Accelerating charge particles are what the disturbance is, okay? And then normally you need to have a medium, but what's unique about light waves is they don't actually require a medium, although in his time, Maxwell would have thought that the medium for these light waves would have been what's called the ether. Uh, nowadays, we don't, we don't think the ether exists, and we kind of understand that these light waves, they propagate um, just through the disturbance of the electromagnetic field. So I'm going to give you an example of this because I think it's important to understand, to be able to visualize what it is we're talking about before we start talking about it because it's really quite tricky. I don't know if I've shown this to you, to this class. I know I've shown it to other people before. I don't know if I've shown it to this class before. Have we looked at this before? So what this is is uh, what we're going to call a radiating charge. We want to understand something about how it is that a positive charge can produce um, a disturbance that can propagate through empty space, basically. So what we have here is, I, I think I've shown this to you guys. I think early, early on, I think I showed it to you. So what we have here, are these lines that are drawn out here, these are electric field lines, right? They're electric field lines. And those electric field lines, as we know, what they mean is that if I came to some random point in space right here and I put a positive charge, the fact that there's an electric field there means that that positive charge would feel a force that would push it away, right? And if I put a negative charge here, it would feel a force that would go toward the positive charge, right? That's our, that's our definition of what electric field is. And these lines, they extend out all around the charge. They technically extend to infinitely far away as well, right? What's amazing is that if you, if you disturb the charge by making it move by a little bit, it'll quite literally send a pulse out. And when I look at that, what I think about is, I think about a, uh, and it sends it out in all directions too, right? You can see every single one of these lines that there's a little pulse that's going out. As long as I move it kind of in a circle, you'll see that pulse go out everywhere. And what that is, is it's, it's effectively a pulse of information if you think about it, right? It's a pulse of information about what that charge did. The charge, if you think about it, all I'm doing is I'm moving the charge up a little bit and then allowing it to fall back down. And you know, lo and behold, you get this little pulse that comes out here. And sometimes that pulse, if I do it like that, it'll come out kind of, you see this little hump? Now, what I want you to understand is that these are waves. Yeah, I can link this to you. All this stuff is on PHET, all, all the kind of things that I use. Most of them, I would say. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's information. It is information, right? It's information about what this thing did. Right? I, I pushed it up. And I pulled it down, and that little that little piece of information propagates like that. Yep. Yep. The wave compresses on itself. What do you mean it compresses on itself? I don't know what you mean. Um, I think the amplitudes. So I, I, the amplitude is becoming greater here. I think it's a feature of how they did the the like it. The the amplitude should technically get smaller. I'll say that. I I think it's getting bigger because of the way that they designed this. I don't think it's necessarily accurate to any real phenomenon. But one thing I want you to think about really quickly here is about what a wave is, because I think people get confused about what waves are. A wave can be any type of a pulse, right? So a really simple example of this is if you take a really long piece of, like a cord, like take an extension cord, for example, and you hold one into the cord and you whip it like that, you can do the same thing with a hose you really just want something that has kind of some weight to it. A little piece of string won't really work very well, but something that has some weight to it, um, so it has some inertia to it, it can it can basically propagate a little pulse like this, right? I'm sure at some point in your life you've all done this before. Like you take a hose, you whip it, and it sends a pulse down it, right? Or you take a, um, that's a wave. I just want to imply, just to be really clear, this is a wave, okay? It's a wave that's traveling in terms of a pulse. Okay, Ash says, if there's a positive charge in between the field lines, it doesn't feel any pulse. No, sure it would. Sure it would. There, there's, there's an infinite number of field lines that we can draw here. And at every point in space, even at a point like here, there is, there's a vector associated with the electric field. 
And if I put a positive charge right here, it would feel those disturbances, right? It would feel that disturbance. A little positive charge could feel that disturbance, right? Now we can also do something like this. Um, we can force it to oscillate up and down and up and down and up and down like this, and it'll continually emit these waves. And if we want to make a sinusoidal wave, we just do it like that. And there we go. Now we've got waves basically just propagating out in all directions. Now, at its core, this is only one particle, right? But if you think about a star, right? If you think about a star, a star is made of plasma. What's plasma? Plasma is ionized gas, which means what you have inside of a plasma is positive um, positive hydrogen ions and negative electrons that are oscillating all over the place. So imagine that inside of a star, you've got trillions and tri 10 to the 30 molecules, really more than that. You've got just absurd, like 10 to the 60 molecules, not molecules, but ions. And they're all oscillating up and down like this, right? Every single one of them emitting these waves out. And what these waves are, as we'll prove here in a little bit, these are light waves. They're waves that carry information about the fact that there's an oscillating charged particle and it emits this radiation, it emits this energy in all directions. And that's how we can see stars, is because when you get enough particles doing this, the amount of energy that's produced is enormous. Just a huge, huge amount of energy when you have all these particles zipping around. And uh, that's what a star is. That's how it produces light. And to take it down to a more um, physical level that we can think about, consider like a hot piece of metal being warmed up, right? So on your on your stove, if you have an electric stove, for example, I don't have a gas stove, but I'm sure you've all seen electric stoves before. You know that if you if you turn the electric stove on, the color of the stove goes from black to like this glowing hot orange red color, right? That color that you're seeing is because when you heat the metal of the stove up, the molecules start to oscillate just like this. And of course, if you've taken 1B, you know that temperature is related to um, how quickly the molecules move. So when they start vibrating more quickly, they emit more energy and they start to glow a different color. And the frequency changes, as you're saying, Ash. But the main point I'm trying to make is that you have a black stove that's not really emitting much light, although technically it is. It's just in a wavelength you can't see. Um, it's in the infrared. And then you heat it up, and all of a sudden, it's sending out energy that you can see, right? And that's happening because the molecules are moving more quickly. They're oscillating a bunch, right? And the faster they oscillate, the more energy they produce. So whether the light be coming from a star that's filled with a gas of ions, a bunch of charged particles, or whether the light's coming from... Um, a light bulb or from a stove or something like that. It's all the same thing. It's all the same stuff. It's just light is produced as long as the particle moves. And when the particle doesn't move, there's no light. Now, technically, particles, they never stop moving. There's, there's no way you can cool something down to the point where it's not moving anymore. But um, little particles, what they do is they jiggle, you know? They, don't, they can't sit still. They're like little dogs or they're like little babies. They just... They, they can't stop moving. They just jiggle all the time. And in that jiggling, they produce energy. And that energy propagates out. And that's what light is. And, and like I was saying, it's, it's not just light. It's information. right? It's information about what the particle was doing. And we use that information. We can send information over long distances using light signals, right? By using fiber optic cables and stuff like that, right? Where you have these flashes of light that indicate information, ons and offs and all that kind of stuff, so... All right, so that's our picture for that. Feel free to play with that as much as you want. There's something I want to mention here, by the way. Did you notice, uh, let's go back to this picture. When we have the sinusoidal one going, do you notice any direction in which there's no, there's no waves? Yeah, vertical, right? Yeah, exactly. So it turns out that the way that this information propagates it's really only perpendicular to the direction of motion of the particle, right? Perpendicular to the direction of motion of the particle. So, yeah, that's um, yeah, orthogonal. That means the same thing as perpendicular. All right, so let's pause this. So that's the wave right there. 
And and one thing I want to emphasize here too, um, I mean, we're just talking about classical electrodynamics here, right? But um, I, after tonight, I think those of you that are taking 1D and learning about how light is both a wave and a particle, uh, ho hopefully after tonight's discussion, you'll understand more about why people really thought that it was a wave, you know? Because Maxwell's argument here is pretty convincing. I hope you're convinced by the end of tonight why it is that light needs to be a wave. Um, but, but one little hint I'm going to give you here about this is that if you think about a single pulse, right? call that a pulse right there, right? This is what a particle of light looks like. It's a pulse. It's like a single pulse. And when you add a bunch of that motion together, well, you get a wave. It's just a bunch of pulses, right? So, all right, let's uh, let's let's actually go through the mathematics. Okay, so our goal is to basically show that, that motion of that particle could produce a disturbance, and that disturbance could propagate um, waves. And we also need to prove that those waves move at the speed of light. That's kind of what, those are all the things that we need to prove, right? Now. Before we get into this, uh, you know, I'll say that uh, Hertz was the first person to actually produce these waves. We talked about this before. He was able to produce these waves in a in a laboratory. He was able to show that they moved at the speed of light. He was able to show that they had a frequency that he expected and all this kind of thing. Um, and that was done about 20 years or so after Einstein. But uh, the type of light that we're going to be talking about here uh, occurs across what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. And I got a little picture of this over here. So this is just the one from your book. There's a lot of definitely better versions of this, but in perusing the internet, this one's just as good as any. So this is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And everything within this spectrum is electromagnetic radiation. Can I explain why it has to be accelerating, Ash? Sure. Because we're taking derivatives. And if you take the derivative of something and it gives you a value, in order for this uh, information to keep propagating, then when you take the derivative again, it needs to get you back where you started again, back to a changing magnetic field. And if it's moving with a constant velocity, you're not going to get anything. In fact, there's actually a way to show that on here. That if it's moving with a constant speed, there's no, there's no radiation that's produced. If that makes sense. No radiation. Yeah, the acceleration exactly from the change in direction, that's right. You know, it's going this way, and then it's going this way, and then it's going this way, and then it's going this way. Just like simple harmonic motion, right? It's accelerating the whole time. And its acceleration is changing, right? Okay. So the electromagnetic spectrum, what we're gonna talk about tonight is, is all light. So that could be any of these things here. If you've ever heard of any of these names that appear in this thing, you're in every case, you're talking about the phenomenon that we call light. Um, there's a very narrow band of what we call visible light. It has wavelengths that range from 700 nanometers to 400 nanometers. Uh, it has frequencies that are in the basically 10 to the 14 hertz range. It's extremely, very, very fast frequency, right? And all of these things move at the same speed in a vacuum. Um, over here on the left, you have very long wavelengths. And on the right, you have shorter wavelengths. Um, the shorter wavelength, it actually represents a higher energy. Um, so the things that you've heard of, like x-rays, they have the ability to penetrate through your skin and give you images of your bones, right? Gamma rays are produced in high energy radioactive experiments, as well as they come from space in the form of cosmic rays. You've heard of ultraviolet rays. These are rays that are above the violet. There's violet on the spectrum. Ultraviolet is you know, greater than violet in terms of its frequency, but smaller in terms of its wavelength. This is the blue side of the spectrum. This is the red side of the spectrum. Lower than red, you've got infrared. Now, like I said, your infrared light is given off by everything. Anything that has any temperature at all gives off infrared light. So there's infrared light coming from your skin. There's infrared light coming from your bodies and 
if, if you have an IR camera, you can see these things. We have an IR camera at the school that I could point towards you and you could see that your, your, your body is giving off infrared radiation. But our eyes can't see this and our eyes can't see this. Our eyes can only see this extremely narrow band. This is all that we can see with our own eyes is just what we call visible light here. And it's been expanded, but it is an extremely tiny fraction that our eyes are suited to, to, to visualizing. In order to see things in the other spectrums, we have to design specific things to do that. In fact, we have infrared telescopes that look at space in the infrared. We have X-ray telescopes that look at space in the X-ray wavelength. And we learn more about what's happening in galaxies, in distant stars, distant nebulas, by looking at what's happening in these different spectrums because stars are giving off all types of energy uh, at different frequencies. And uh, you know, looking at the sky in the infrared versus the X-ray spectrum, we can see new things. Uh, included on here is also something that we use to heat food, which is microwaves. Uh, it just happens to be the case that light of this particular energy is very, very easily absorbed by uh, water in your food. So when you put your food into a microwave oven, uh, little invisible rays of light, they're invisible, right? Because they're not part of the visible spectrum. They, they're absorbed by your food. And then way over here on the left end, we have uh, radio and TV. Now, I, I want to emphasize that these, these demarcations are not by any means... Um, they're kind of just guidelines, you might see. Uh, X-rays, as you can see, kind of, you know, they overlap with ultraviolet rays and they overlap with gamma rays too. Same thing with microwave and infrared. And when we say radio and TV over here, a more updated thing to put on here is Wi-Fi would be on this list too. So Wi-Fi radios are in like the gigahertz range. Gigahertz is down here, 10 to the nine, right? Uh, and so yeah, radio, TV, these are just, you know, Another thing to notice about these is that the, the wavelengths of these radio waves, the kind that your, your radio picks up, they can be 10 meters and you can even go farther here. I think that radio waves can be as big as a kilometer, actually, a thousand meters. It's a huge, huge wavelength if you think about it. Um, smaller wavelength means higher energy and higher energy means that it can basically do more damage to you. The, the radiation that's up in these frequencies is often referred to as ionizing radiation because it can cause serious damage to, uh, to biological subjects, to like people and to animals and stuff like that. Ash says, apparently these visible spectrum are the peak intensities from the sun, which that's right. Yeah, so the peak intensity that comes from the sun is right here in the middle. And yeah, that's that's exactly right. That's why we've we've evolved to perceive them, is that the energy coming from the sun peaks at this at this point right here. At green, which is why the vast majority of our planet is green. And life is green, right? So um what else to say about this? That's the electromagnetic spectrum. And all of this is what we call light in physics or electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation. We'll be talking about all this stuff today. One thing that all of these waves have in common is there is a constant ratio between the wavelength and the frequency or the wavelength times the frequency is a constant. And if you take the wavelength of the wave and you multiply by the frequency of the wave, you get the speed of light. Very handy piece of information to know when you're solving problems for this chapter. And I guess in case it isn't clear at all, if I have a wave that's traveling like this, then lambda is the length of the wave, basically. So if this is the x direction, for example, it's, this is lambda. Uh, your question is, is this electromagnetic radiation the same radiation that's associated with radioactive species and damaging? Certainly a lot of the radiation can be damaging, especially up in these higher energy ranges up here, this higher frequency. Um, radioactive species, you mean like things like uranium and radon and stuff like that? Is that what you mean? Chemicals? Um, so... The short answer is yes, except that it would depend on what kind of radiation it is. So when you study nuclear physics, you learn about like alpha radiation, you learn about beta radiation, you learn about gamma radiation. This one is photons. So yes, if it's gamma radiation, it's the same thing. This beta radiation, does anyone know what that is at its core? At first, when they were studying things, yeah, it's electrons. Anyone know what alpha radiation is? Helium. Yeah, it's helium. It's helium. 
I don't know how to write this. It's a helium nucleus, so it's like helium two plus or something like that. Plus plus. I don't know how you write that, but um, we are learning a type of radiation. So this is this is often referred to as electromagnetic radiation, and it's radiation because it radiates out from a system, right? It doesn't mean it's the same thing as radioactivity, though. So don't 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 confuse it with radioactivity, Ash. If, if that's what you're thinking, if you think about radioactivity, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing because radioactivity is a nuclear process that involves, um, uh, well, it involves the weak force basically, usually, in which um, particle species change their nature, such as a, a neutron decaying to a proton uh, and then producing radiation. But um, yeah, Radio radioactivity, radiation, two different things. Radiation can be the light radiated from a light bulb, the light radiated from the sun. Radioactivity means you have particles that are breaking down and they may give off photons, right? They may give off light even, but uh, um, the process radioactivity is slightly different than what we're discussing tonight. All we're talking about tonight is just particles that uh, that are that are jiggling, and that jiggling produces light. Okay, so visible light is written like this. Something you guys probably know is that white light contains all frequencies. Um, you know, uh, if something is white, it's because it's a combination of all of these frequencies combining together. And something that was first proved by, I don't know if it was Newton that first did this. Newton was the first one to come up with an explanation, though, that if you pass white light through a prism, it will break up into these different frequencies here, basically showing that white light is composed of different frequencies. And I don't know if Newton actually figured that out. But um, we can also have light that's produced in just one specific band. Laser light is an example of what we call monochromatic light. Laser light is basically, it could be all yellow or all green. Or, you know, you, if you think about laser pointers, right? Laser pointers, they have one color, commonly red or green, right? And a, 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 a true laser has almost completely all the light in exactly one frequency, basically. Um, and that's, uh, that's useful for certain things. Uh, something you learn about if you take 1D is that you need to have what's called monochromatic or laser light in order to produce really strong interference effects. Um, and I think when you do those experiments in 1D, you just use laser pointers, right? You use these little, uh, these little laser pointers, basically, and you, you, you use them to show you can, you can produce interference patterns. White light, harder to produce interference patterns. Yellow light, really easy to produce interference patterns. Okay. Oh, in person, right? You guys aren't actually doing experiments. <sighs> but, uh, yeah. Okay. Um... The radio bands down here are used for communication. They're sold and bought. Very, very valuable, the, the bands. These, these frequencies carry information, and these lower frequencies here are very valuable. I was listening to a story recently about how there was a person who operated a bunch of TV stations in Pittsburgh, and um, I think that, I don't know, the, the TV stations weren't popular anymore or something, and he was he was trying to sell them, and he'd, he'd owned them for years, and they had they're just normal TV stations. They were like local TV stations in Pittsburgh. They carried like the news and if there was some like community event, like a play or something like that, it might be broadcast on it. And uh, about like five to 10 years ago, I guess, um, he started getting all these people contacting him and they wanted to purchase his radio waves. They wanted to, pur they basically wanted to produce, purchase the bandwidth. And what it was, was hedge companies that were buying up as much of these spectrum as they could. Imagine you're quite literally purchasing it's like an address, you know? It's like a number. And you say, between these bands, like between these numbers right here, you say, that's where we're going to allow Wi-Fi communication to occur, or that's where we're going to allow cell phone communication to occur, right? And so, you know, an owner of a TV station might have just a very small number here, but these big hedge funds were buying up as much as they could, and they resold them to the government for massive profit. I think in the in the story I was listening to, he sold his, he sold his just the bandwidth for his radio station's his TV stations for, I want to say $10 million. But then in the resale to the government, these hedge funds sold them for $100 million. So they got like 10 to 1 on their investment, right? They made huge amounts of money just by buying bandwidth. Buying, you know, a right. It's like buying property, but you're buying, you're buying a bandwidth within this uh, frequency range and saying, okay, on this frequency range, no one's allowed to talk. Right, no one can put a put a radio station in this frequency range because if you do, uh, you're going to interfere with the communication we're trying to do. If you broadcast at that frequency, it's illegal. 
I don't know how it works, Ash, but I knew, I do know that if if you were to be broadcasting at a high enough power such that um, it would interrupt with this communication, and the communication could be military communication, right? Man, even the light spectrum, you can't get away from capitalism. That's it's very true, Jesus. It's very true. So everything can be bought, even even just numbers. But it's it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because if we didn't have a process by which you purchase rights to the bandwidth, then anybody could 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 send out information on that bandwidth, and so radios would be very hard to sell. You know, like how could you sell a radio if like you can't guarantee that that radio is going to allow you to tune into the commercially available radio stations, right? You want to know that when you go and buy a radio or buy a, a Wi-Fi router, that it's going to work and that somebody else isn't going to be sending information along those same channels, right? So, so yeah, it's capitalism, but it kind of benefits you as the consumer, right? But if there's a finite number of wavelengths, won't we run out? We won't run out. And there's really not a finite number of wavelengths. There's not. There's just bands. They sell bands. Within that band, there's really an infinite number, but there is some kind of like fundamental limit to how close you can space together the communications. Like how many frequencies? Because like you know, on like on your on your we talked about this last time, on your radio, there's like if you if you scroll through the radio dial, there's like 106.7. The next station up is 106.9. These are in megahertz, by the way, in case you guys don't know. You can see where that would show up on this dial. It'd be like, actually, it's off of the dial here, right? But there is no station at 106.8, and the main reason is to make sure that this sta station is distinguished from this station, so you don't get, you know, uh, so, so you can actually hear the song you're listening to, right? Or you can hear the, the news that you're listening to on that. And the same thing goes for your Wi-Fi stations, right? Or Wi-Fi radios, right? When people are using ham radios, it's uh, it's it's down here in the radio range. Ham radio is down here in the radio range, Nathan. It's I think it's more like the kilohertz range, closer to AM, shorter even. So ham radio is like a really long wave, long wavelengths. Mr. Miara said, uh, if you ever go sailing, there's a frequency you're not allowed to broadcast on unless it's an emergency. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's valuable, right? That's valuable, right, Mr. Rios? Uh, ham radio is a special wavelength that has been uh, basically portioned out for the public to use. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a specific frequency that you, you can't talk to people on because it's used um, it's used for emergencies and stuff like that, right? And, and you need to have these things. It's the same reason we have laws, you know, just in general. You know, they generally tend to make uh, life better for people or limit people's freedom in a way that, uh, that that can be good. No comment. No comment about what? About laws? FCC can put you in a jail and it's a $200,000 penalty. That's wild. That's a lot of money. Um, yeah, I mean, we could we could talk about how some laws are bad and some laws are good and stuff like that, but I, I think that fundamentally we kind of need a lot of them. And I'm just speaking specifically to the law about the about not using certain uh, wavelengths of communication when you're on the ocean because the the Coast Guard would need to use them in case someone needs a rescue. You know what I mean? And that's <laughs> I mean, it's a that's that's a question of like life or death, right? Uh, is is of if if these people are trying to communicate and uh, they're trying to tell, you know, find someone that's like drowning at sea or try to find uh, a ship that's sinking or something like that and they're having an issue, well then, I mean, that's bad. I think that's unquestionably bad. But um, I know what you mean. A lot of laws are not necessarily in our interest. Uh, as a very modern one, I mean, we just passed this law in California about the the, the gig contractors, right? That they don't have to consider their people employees. They don't have to give them benefits. Da, 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 da. I think that's a bad law, personally. But I don't know. But yeah. Anyway. So uh, okay. So that's the the electromagnetic spectrum. And yeah. So so what we want to do now is I want to talk about plane waves. Uh, and I'm going to describe what a plane wave is and why we can use it to describe what we want to do here.
this is pretty essential to what we're going to be discussing tonight, so... Um, just, if you have any questions, please ask. So, um, a plane wave, what it is, is, is very similar to what we saw here with our oscillating wave, okay? But the idea would be, what does such a wave look like when you're really far away from it, right? So I've got a source of electromagnetic waves, let's say a star, like a distant star. And this, this star is gonna produce electromagnetic waves that are gonna propagate out in all directions. Like this, okay? And as they get farther and farther and farther apart from each other, the star, it's producing electromagnetic waves and they're sending out in all kinds of directions, right? Um, if, if I were to look at the kind of surface of the wave, okay, what I would do is I'd probably draw a circle like that. And closer to the star, I'd draw a circle maybe like that. And I want to call this is basically a wave front. And if you think about it, it's going to be like ripples in a pond, right? These wave fronts are going to be like these just waves of energy that are going throughout space, right? And um, they're like little ripples in a pond that are produced by this star. There is no pond, though. It's it's just the electric field that this that these waves are propagating throughout. Now, when I go very far away, for example, let's say let's say over here we have Earth. And let's say this is just a very distant star, right? What's going to happen to these wave fronts is they're going to produce less and less curvature. That was a very bad drawing, but they're going to get less and less curvy as they go out. Bigger and bigger and bigger circles. Until once you're far enough away, those circles are going to start to look like lines. So the wave travels this way, and it travels this way, and it travels this way. The intensity of the light that's produced is getting weaker and weaker and weaker as you propagate through space because you're farther from the source. And because that light intensity has to be spread out over a sphere, so the intensity of the light falls off as 1 over r squared. But eventually, these wave fronts, okay, like this one and this one here, are going to be flat, okay? And so this is going to be what we call a plane wave. It's a wave that has its wave front as a plane, okay? As an actual you know, just a plane, basically. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I draw something else on here. Yeah, see, this is gonna be really hard for me to draw. But, but yeah, it's gonna be like the, I'm drawing it as a straight line right here, but you should imagine that this straight line, there's like a sheet that's coming kind of into the page. Like imagine to take a piece of paper and put it up perpendicular to your screen and just line it up with these lines, basically. Right, so you basically have just one big, let me try to actually draw it here, one big sheet that's traveling this way and another big sheet that's parallel to it that's traveling like that way. That's my plane wave, basically. Does that idea make sense as to what a plane wave is? The other piece of this is that what we saw in the picture before was that these little waves are waves of the electric field, right? So what I'm gonna say is that when we discuss this stuff, on these planes, what we're gonna have is there's gonna be an electric field and it's going to tend to point kind of like this, for example. And then there's going to be a magnetic field that's going to be perpendicular to it, pointing kind of like this. And these are going to be what we call plane waves. Electric field, magnetic fields. And in particular, these fields are going to have to be perpendicular to each other. And when you combine them together, and you use your right-hand rule, you do E cross B, you can learn something about the propagation of the wave. And I'm just going to pull up this picture right here because it's definitely better than I could possibly draw myself. So this is how we think about these waves. You've got a y direction and a z direction. The electric field points along the y direction. The magnetic field points along the z direction. And then the direction of propagation is given by E cross B. You rotate your fingers from E to B, and then the thumb points in the direction of the propagation of the wave. The vector here says C because we use C for the speed of light. But the plane is going to be the xy plane right here. So on my picture right here, the y direction is going up, the z direction is coming out of the page, and the direction of propagation is to the right. And we're going to consider that 
our plane wave, which is coming from this distant star, is going to have all of these electric field vectors within this one within this one system right here. Does that make sense? When I say plane wave, it's basically a wave front that is straight. Again, as, as always, this diagram came from your textbook, so it's, it's, it's in the textbook, but I will upload it for you, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, does a plane wave make sense to you? Does it make sense? Does anyone have any questions? The idea would be here that the field, the electric field itself, too, would be kind of oscillating between these waves. So... What you can imagine here is that there's like a wave. I didn't, I didn't really draw it super well to show this, but it's like there's a wave that's like, you know, like that. And at different points in space, you've got different values of the electric field like this. If that makes any sense. And then the magnetic field's doing the same thing. I'm going to undo what I just drew there, but that's kind of what you want to imagine is happening here. Would the math get too complicated if we let the wave be arched? Um, no, the math would probably be about the same, uh, because at the end of the day, we would be, we'd be looking at a very small portion. If we look, if we looked at the curved surface of something like this here, we would just zoom in close enough that it looked like a straight line anyway. That's what we usually do in physics, right? Is like, if something is curvy, you just zoom in close enough to make it flat because there's, there's always some scale at which it would be flat. The math would be about the same. Plane waves are just, if this is the simplest possible kind there is, is the reason why we focus on plane waves, um, is it's just, it's just, it's, it's absolutely the simplest version of this. Um, because when we look at this animation, describing what's happening here is quite a bit trickier, but as long as you just stop at one point here, I mean, and it's, let's kind of move this thing way over here. <laughs> It looks so cool when you when you like think about what happens to these electromagnetic like when you just I don't know it's really neat, but um even here if I start this at the far left right you'll start to be able to see plane waves in this too oh it doesn't let me do that well my point being that these wave fronts here over here to the right they start to become very flat right compared to here where they're very curvy they just get flatter and flatter and fatter so it, it doesn't it doesn't even have to go that far before you're already talking about plane waves. And 100%, if we're talking about a star, a distant star, that's, I mean, the closest star the, to the Earth is uh, uh, Alpha Centauri. Right? Alpha Proxima Centauri is the name of the star, I think. I think the system's called Alpha Centauri. Um, okay, yeah, the sun is the closest to the Earth. Yeah, that's right. But uh, thinking about a distant star that looks like a point in space, even the sun, the sun is far enough away, right? that if you were to look at the curvature of a wave produced by the sun at the surface of the earth, because the sun is 1.5 times 10 to the 11 um, meters away, 10 to the 11 meters is really far. It takes light eight minutes to travel that distance from the sun to the earth. So ev even from the sun to the earth, these waves are gonna be roughly parallel. The wave fronts are gonna be roughly parallel to each other at that point, right? So, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. It's seven o'clock and we'll come back and we're gonna do the math and hopefully we can do all the math in one video and then we can spend the rest of class doing some problems. But, uh, there's some other stuff we have to do too. So, you know, all right, I'm going to pause this for now or stop the recording for now.